الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف المرسلين سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه البر المالمين وعلى من تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين All praise, all credit belong to Allah most high, most kind, most forgiving. And we send our greetings of peace and health and soundness and wholeness. That's what the word salam all means to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, to the other messengers, to the companions of the Prophet, to his family and to his followers, wherever they might be, and we hope to be among them. And these greetings that we send through Allah will, will be returned and with Allah's blessing through the angels and through Allah's power and will bring us back the same. Salam, peace, health, and wholeness. Sin lam mim salama is the, the word root from which Islam comes and it has multiple meanings that the Quran explains to, to us. One of them has to do with ladder. Sulam is ladder. And uh, maybe it, it, it would be too much philosophy to talk about how ladder relates to peace and, and to Islam. But the meanings in Salam include um, surrendering, they include being safe from harm, and they include being healthy, unblemished. The cow in Surat Al-Baqarah is described as Musallama. La shiyata fiha. Impeccable. There is no blemish in, on her, on the cow. So when, and, and salam means peace, and it means uh, the opposite of war. And, uh, so all those meanings are in Islam and salam. Surah 17. Verse 9 starts with a series of, of commandments and uh, it prefaces that by saying A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajeem Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Inna hadha al-Qur'an yahdi lillati hiya aqwam wa yubashiru al-mu'minin al-lazina ya'maluna al-salihati anna lahum ajran kabira Just to read the beginning verse. Surah 17, Surah 17, verse 9. Ayah 9, and um, it goes on, on and on. <coughs> until... Verse um, 39, we, we, can, we can consider verse 39 to be the, the end of this section, which has all kinds of commandments, certainly 
more than Ten Commandments. Verse 36 is what I would like to focus on. Verse 36 of Surah 17 says, and it's in the singular. So this is a requirement of every single Muslim, of every single human being. This is what's required. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ولا تقف ما ليس لك به علم إن السمع والبصر والفؤاد كل أولئك كان عنه مسؤولا and do not follow what you don't have knowledge of meaning do not follow what you don't personally, you, one human being. This is the imperative, and it's wala taqfu. It's addressed to every human being. Verse 36, ayah 36 of Surah 17. Do not follow, you single human being, what you don't personally have knowledge of. Do not say my leader said. Do not say my father said. Do not say my scholar said. Do not say hadith said. Ultimately, knowledge is in the Quran. <coughs> One thing that Muslims have done that is equivalent, yes, Brother Clarence, equivalent to what the Jews have done with their rabbis is place hadith above Quran is come to us with hadith and interpret that hadith in a way that supersedes Quran and then after they have done that to Quran and subject, subjugated Quran to hadith they come to us and say there is this scholar and this imam, and that imam, and this madhab, and that madhab, that says this, and they put that above the hadith and above the Quran. This is exactly what the Jews and the Christians have done with their priests, with their rabbis, and scholars, and fathers. And when the Quran warns about us not following the fathers, what the fathers believe, what the culture says, what tra the tradition, the teachings of the elders. It doesn't matter whether they are the elders of Zion or the elders of the Muslims or the elders of the Christians. When we go by what our elders do, we are violating the most often repeated commandment in the Quran. Do not follow what your fathers follow. Follow this Quran. You need knowledge, personal knowledge of everything you do. And the Quran keeps repeating that it has been made easy, it has been made simple for every human being, educated or uneducated, literate or illiterate to see the principles and to follow them. You don't have to be an intellectual to understand the Quran. You don't have to be, you don't even have to, to go to school in order to understand the Quran. The principles of the Quran, first of all, it was read by an illiterate person. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was illiterate. Never went to school, he never learned how to read and write. Allah gave us the Quran for every human being to follow it. And they only need to follow what they understand because the Quran describes itself as self repeating. Self repeating in different forms, in different versions. 
And very often in the Quran, when we're reading something, we say, oh, this was said there and there. Even if we have read only little Quran, we notice the repetition. And the purpose of the repetition is to make it more available to more people of different intelligence, of different capability to understand. Personal responsibility to read the Quran and follow it is upon every human being, upon every Muslim. And any time this principle is violated, we have some kind of shirk. So I was shocked to see on the internet a young man with a beard who has uh, recorded, and he thinks he's being a scholar, his study of the history and um, the statements, the teachings of a certain Muslim scholar. And he said, see, he does not follow this madhab. He does not follow this madhab. None of the four madhabs. So he's not a Muslim. And we were in a discussion on, on Sunday. And something was said in that direction, that there are four madhabs. And they are what we have been given. And if we don't go by any of those four of those scholars, the leading scholars of Islam, then we can go astray. No, no, that's wrong. This verse places personal responsibility for every Muslim, even the followers of Maliki and Hanbali and Shafi'i. and um, Hanafi, all those four madhabs. The imams have told their followers, those four imams have told their followers that they should look at the Quran and go by the Quran. And if they find something in the Quran that in their own personal understanding contradicts what the imam said, then they should throw away what the imam said. And I am certain that Imam W.D. Muhammad Rahmatullah Ali have said the same. And the purpose of imams and scholars and the purpose of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's just human. His purpose, as the Quran states, is to show us what the Quran means and how to apply the Quran to our life. There are no two gods. There is no scholar above God. There is no scholar needed to um, explain the Quran to us. We have to understand the Quran. The scholar shows us how to understand the Quran and to be a Muslim means to understand the Quran and apply it. We become Muslims not to hadith. We are Muslims to the Quran. We submit to the Quran. We don't submit to hadith, ultimately. So the purpose of hadith is to understand the Quran. I'm not going the way of Gaddafi, rahmatullahi alayhi, when he was in his young and misguided um, mind. And he thought that hadith was uh, not important or that uh, there is so much corruption in hadith and, and so many false hadith that we should just stick to the Quran. We can't go that far. Hadith and what the scholars do, all the teachers of Islam, we respect them for their contribution to helping us understand the Quran. And a good scholar would always show you where in the Qur'an this principle is laid out and shows you that the hadith is explaining the Qur'an. A very good scholar would find the Qur'an, would find the ayat, and show us how these ayat 
um, are the basis of the hadith. But not all scholars are capable of doing that because not all scholars have memorized the Quran in such a way that they would uh, find the ayah for every hadith. But there is an ayah for every hadith because the Quran itself says, and I will bring you the verse uh, next time, but you will find it yourself as you, as you peruse the Quran, as you go through the Quran, it will keep repeating this principle. We have only given you this book you, O Prophet Muhammad, to explain to the people what has been sent down to them. Not your opinions, not your hadith. The hadith is, serves the Quran. The Quran says that constantly. The hadith serves the Quran. And we have this book that Allah promised to preserve. Allah has not promised to preserve hadith. Allah has promised to preserve the Quran. And hadith has not been preserved perfectly. It has been served with utmost dedication and scrutiny. But we can't rely on hadith above the place of the Quran. We can't look at a hadith and say, this is not in the Quran. No, it never happens. Allah is above that. Allah has told us that the Quran is complete and he is pleased with it as a complete religion for us. We can turn around and say it is incomplete. Here's a hadith that complements it. Here's a hadith that makes it complete. We can't do that. That is shirk. That is worshiping the Prophet. That is placing the Prophet above Allah. Allah has made the Quran complete and the Prophet came to explain to us the Quran. That's what the Quran says. And that's uh, the point that I was trying to make, Brother Clarence. I would never, I would never um, be disrespectful to the work of a scholar or the work of the leading scholars or disrespectful of the Hadith and its place. As, uh, as a gift from Allah, as a very important gift from Allah that would help us understand Islam, and understand the Quran, the basis of Islam, and apply it to our lives. Do not follow what you have no personal knowledge of. You yourself. Because you're hearing your eyesight and your heart. Now these three words, hearing, eyesight, and heart, together tell us that what we need to rely upon in reading the Quran and following it is our external hearing and our internal hearing. Why do I say that? Because in the list of three, there is fu'ad, is the heart. The Quran often says, don't they have hearts with which they can think? We Muslims think with our hearts. We don't think with our intellect. We don't think with our brain. We don't think with our mind. The mind is often the enemy. That's where shaitan comes. Arguments. Logic. Allah tells us to think with our heart. What feels good is what our heart, which is the seat of our soul. Our soul is in our heart. In fact, the word heart often in the Quran means soul. So our soul is what thinks correctly. Our mind thinks and strays. Our brain thinks and strays. But our heart is protected by Allah's guidance. He blew into us from his spirit, which doesn't mean a part of Allah, but Allah has honored us with a spirit that he calls my spirit. And that spirit is what we use to think, and what we use to hear, and what we use to see. That is the basis of our true senses. In the sama wal basara wal fuad, sama, 
بصر فؤاد كل أولئك all those are being are going to be asked about it what you do your senses are going to be asked about every single action you do have you used your ear your external and your internal ear have you used your eyesight have you used your heart when you were reading that verse of the Quran that ayah of the Quran and you are following it in your life have you used those don't say my imam said don't say the scholar said don't say it is written no your senses and your intellect are going to be asked you are going to be responsible mas'ul means responsible you're going to be taken to account you're going to be judged you're going to be punished if you don't make use of your mind the heart's mind not the brain's mind and your hearing and your eyesight and if you don't think with your spirit with your heart about the ayahs as you follow them and use everything else other than the Quran as support in understanding the Quran I would like to stop right here with my uh, explanation and um, in the future I would like to stop even earlier and see if someone has a question on that and, um, if you read the Quran you will see the word heart qalb 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 means heart and it's um, and there's also the word fuad uh, fuad is is uh, the um, the spiritual heart the spiritual aspect of the heart but qalb can mean also this this heart that you know that has the blood in it but um, e either way um, Allah wants us um, and there's aql aql um, means the mind but when Allah says don't they use their their aql their mind he doesn't mean the intellect or the logic um, logic is is actually not very smart Muslim scholars and also modern-day scientists have found out that that logic is 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 stupid and limited and that intelligence does not rely on logic intelligence relies on a on a mind that is flexible and makes use of, of multiple meanings of ambiguity logic is rigid and it goes around in circles and um, it doesn't help you think really but some people um, think that logic which is just like fixed rules of one and one is two and so on so um, rational is often associated with, with logic but, but the true understanding is in the heart that's why soul and heart it's a conclusion that that um, Muslim scholars have drawn that when when Allah uses the word heart or mind or soul self nafs then very often more often than not he means the same thing our soul it's it's what thinks it's what feels it's all in one and and it's hidden from us but it's the most important thing for us maybe it's hidden from us so that we we don't mess it up <laughs> because we we do try to mess it up all the time we mess up our souls 